Welcome everybody to uh, Bleeding Edge MDX presentation. My name is Tim Fache. I'll be your host for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, I work for a company called Applied OLAP and we do have a giveaway. So we're giving away a $200 MasterCard uh, to one lucky contestant here. And I've posted the URL below and I will actually put this into if I can figure out how to do it, I can put it into the chat window here and then you guys can click on it, hopefully. So let me uh, try to do that here. Um, actually, I don't know that I can. I don't see the chat window here. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, let me do this to everyone. You should be able to click on that link in the chat and go out there and uh, enter for $200 a gift card. So that will be fun. All right, so let's get started here. <clears throat> All right, let me take control. All right, so a little bit about me. So I started working with S-Space back in 1998, started with version four of S-Space. Um, used to be able to install it from a single CD. And um, I'm current, so I'm all the way up to 21C, which is going to be the new, uh, well, I guess they call it cloud or on-prem version. So I've had a number of different jobs over the years, a traveling consultant. I've worked in beta testing for SBase. Uh, I've been an SBase developer. I've worked on the business side, um, I've managed a team of SBase developers. I'm currently an Oracle ACE and a pre-sales solution specialist at Applied OLAP, which means that I help customers uh, with proofs of concept and training and a lot of other things. And I hold a bachelor's in economics and MBA in finance. So that's a little bit about my background. Now, the first time that I spoke at Solutions, actually the only time I ever spoke at Solutions prior to this, it was in 2000 in Las Vegas. So I was giving a presentation, um, much less gray hair than I have now. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I had a standing room only crowd um, talking about moving to S-Base version six because I had worked on the beta. So I was um, real knowledgeable about that and gave a kind of a migration plan for folks to move from five to six. So the, I remember the big new feature there was attributes that was coming out. <clears throat> So I speak at Solutions every 20 years. Um, and in my free time, I enjoy running and playing ice hockey. So I love to talk about those things. A little bit about my company. So Applied OLAP, um, founder and president is Tim Cho, which many of you are probably familiar with. He gives uh, talks on MDX all the time. So uh, my talk will be a little bit different, but I do want to give him a little bit of credit because I lifted a couple of his intro slides. And uh, so I want to give him a shout out and appreciation for uh, helping me with my presentation. Um, so we do uh, we do S-Base. I mean, that's what that's our core. We we make S-Base better. So Dodeca Spreadsheet Management System, if you're not familiar with it, um, it is it interfaces with S-Base relational and does uh, has awesome reporting capabilities. So if anyone um, wants a demo, send an email, dodeca at appliedolap.com. We also have a plugin replacement for the classic S-Base Excel add-in, um, which for those of you who didn't want to move to SmartView, you can use our add-in and, and we interface with all the latest versions of S-Base um, and old versions of S-Base too, if you don't want to move. And we also have DrillBridge, which allows drill through from uh, EPM sources. All right, so let's start with a little bit of fun here. So this is top 10 things that were never said by an S-Base developer. Uh, number 10. 10 seconds for a default retrieve, sounds good to me. Number nine, my partition validated without warnings. I don't think I ever had that happen. Uh, number eight, oh, the documentation explains everything. And number seven, ASO and BSO are pretty much the same. Number six, I love when they use pyramid headers. 
Number five, you want to start out with navigate without data checked. Number four, I use the currency conversion database. Number three, pound missing and zero are the same thing. Number two, it doesn't matter which dimensions you make dense. And the number one thing never said by an S-based developer, MDX is just like SQL. So that brings us to our presentation for today about MDX. So what is MDX? So this is a standards-based way of extracting and manipulating data from an OLAP source. So uh, some of you may be surprised about that second part of that sentence. And we'll talk more about that later. So data is treated like it, it's in a grid. So essentially how you would retrieve data in uh, Excel, rows and columns. So why is it important? So it's really powerful. I've got 145 functions that I can use to pull data. It's flexible. It allows me to do a lot of things with all of those different functions. And I'm gonna give you a little bit about my background. Why is MDX important to me? So I started working with Sears at Sears Holdings um, uh, a number of years ago. That was uh, my previous position was as an S-based developer at Sears Holdings. And I walked into a situation where they had had S-based forever and very complicated system for production, large servers, and um, many, many cubes. And one of the cubes was this large allocation model. So they'd have to aggregate the cube and it was partitioned across like six different cubes. They'd have to aggregate the cube, run this complex, it was a 3000 line calc script to do all of the allocations and then aggregate the cube again. The process took about four hours. So, um, I needed a way of improving that. That the it was just too long of a turnaround. People would have to wait a day or two to see their numbers change sometimes the way that they wanted if they wanted to have a couple iterations. So that was just not acceptable. So I started looking into how we could do this aggregation, this uh, allocation in ASO. And I started working with the execute allocation and execute calculations. And I was able to, within about a month, take that complicated BSO process and migrate it to an ASO cube. I rewrote the calc script in, um, it, it, with MDX essentially. And I got the process down from four hours to 10 minutes. The people were absolutely flabbergasted. They couldn't believe the performance that I got. And so people, um, I'm kind of branded in the S-Base world as, hey, he's the crazy ASO guy. Well, there's a reason for that. I mean, the performance is way better than BSO. I don't have to screw around with dense and sparse. I don't have to um, mess around with tuning the thing all the time. Uh, it aggregates for me. I don't have to worry about that. It's just so much faster and I think so much better. Um, but the, the knock is always, we can't do calculations in ASL. We can't do these low level calculations. Well, that's changing. And so I'll talk a little bit about that today. So let's get down to the basics of MDX. What is MDX? How does it work? And so we'll, for a starter, a beginner, um, what are the basic syntax of MDX? So we've got these things called uh, tuples. Right? And a tuple refers to a member or a member combination. So uh, a couple examples here. Let me see here. I'm trying to use my fancy new pointer. So um, this first example is a member and we've got 100-10. And in MDX, you put the members within square brackets and a tuple within parentheses. All right, so that's the, the first one, a very simple, a single member, right? The second one, we've got a member combination. So this is, we've got 100-10 and actuals. So that intersection, right? 
So, um, so a little bit more about tuples. So that you need to note that when you when you specify a tuple, that it includes a member from each base dimension, regardless of um, whether you state it or not. So if you have a missing member, the S base engine is going to infer what that is, right? So it's going to say for this 100 10 actuals, it's, it's going to build that out and say it's 110 actuals, but it's also sales, year, or market. So um, actually that, that should probably be like the base dimension, um, which would be measures, year, and market. So that's a, my fault there. Um, okay, so that's a tuple. That's kind of the basic. And you can, as a, just a hint, for those of you still living in that BSO world, um, you can think of it kind of like a cross-dimensional operator. So 100-10 at actual. It's kind of a, a way of thinking about it. All right, so we also have sets. And a set is just a collection of one or more tuples. So an example of that. So we're back here to our 100-10. And now instead of it just being um, a single member, it's considered a set. So that that's still can be a set. And we've put our tuple now into a set, right? But we can expand that now past where we just have a single uh, intersection where we have two intersections. So I've got 100-10 and budget, all right? We can also have um, build a set using functions. So in this function, we've got children, and year is a member. So this is gonna bring back me a set of all the children of year. There's another way of using functions in MDX. So you'll see this sometimes where we use the dot notation to use a function. And so this is just putting the levels function for level zero on that product member. Hey, give me back all the level zero members under product, okay? So the basic, now that we've got kind of those building blocks of the tuples and sets, now we can build uh, a, a select statement. So all the MDX um, uses the word select to pull the data in. And then we can give it our sets for our columns and our set for our rows, right? So we're specifying, hey, give me all the children of year on my columns. Give me all the children of market on my rows. So it's not really that complicated. It's just like we're uh, programmatically building out an S-based retrieval sheet. And I tell it I want uh, to use the sample basic cube. Now I also have here a where clause. So I've got my column set, my row set, my source cube, and now my where clause. It's also known as the slicer. So it kind of like takes a slice out of the cube. In this case, our page members is, is, is what it acts like. Um, so you're looking at root beer, sales, actuals. So give me all of the children of years across the column, children of market on the rows, and then my page members will be root beer, sales, and actuals, right? And this is what it looks like. And you can pull this data um, in the EAS. You can run an MDX. You can run it in SmartView to pull back data. In the cloud, there is a, a way of, of running this and pulling the data as well. So just to get that um, view. Now, uh, Dodeca, our product also pulls this data and we work um, seamlessly with MDX. So it's another way of pulling in that data. All right, so now that we've got kind of the basic syntax down, the really one of the most powerful functions is cross-join. So with cross-join, you can join different sets together to make bigger sets, all right? So the use case here, a uh, simple one is you need all the months for all products. And so I've got my sets. I've got my descendants of year and I've got my descendants of product. Now, how do I put those two together? Really simply, I just create a cross join, descendants of year, descendants of product, and now I've got those put together. Now, this is where I think a lot of people get kind of tripped up 
in um, writing MDX that some of the statements start getting a little wordy. And so it helps to, I think, um, just format and uh, put in spacing and things like that to make it a little bit more readable because these start to get big, right? So I can nest cross joints. So I can take that original year and product set and I can cross join that with all the sense of market, right? And so these get really, really big. If you've got a really, really big cube and you ask for all the descendants of each dimension, you're talking about, I don't even know the, the, the numbers that it can get to. It can get really, really big. Now, there is um, documentation. So um, I've included the URL here and you can go out and look at the actual query limits. So all of this is documented. And over time, I've noticed um, from when MDX was first introduced to now, those limits keep getting bigger. Now, I went out and looked at the documentation um, just yesterday, and it looks like the set that they used to, in 11.124, that they used to support was two to the 64th. If you look at this documentation, it says it's two to the 640th. Now I haven't had a chance to test that. Um, I'm hoping it's true, but my gut tells me that maybe it was a, uh, a typo, but maybe it's true. And if it, if, it, if it has grown by that much, then you should have no problems doing whatever you want to do in, uh, in MDX. All right. So uh, another, another example, let's, let's look at an example of using cross-join with a select here. All right, so we've got um, our select statement and we're gonna ask for the children of market on our column, so across the top. And we're gonna ask for uh, the descendants of year joined with the, the, the children of COLA on the rows. And in our page, we'll, page members will put sales and actual. So what does that look like? All right, so we've got our sales and actuals here up the top. We've got our children of market across our columns. And now you'll see it's just as if you were um, navigating through uh, Excel, the Excel add-in or smart view, and you uh, double clicked or asked for the children of, uh, of COLAs and the children uh, or the descendants of year. So, um, it's really not that complicated, I think. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the, this is bleeding edge, right? So far we've covered all basics and stuff that everybody knows about uh, MDX who's, who's spent much time at all with MDX. So what's new? So there's a new function. Well, it's kind of new, right? It's called cross join attribute it only gives back valid intersections, right? So what do I mean by a valid intersection? If I have an attribute dimension and I have that base, base member, that, that attribute is only assigned to one of those base members. So it's only gonna pull back that the correct attribute for that member. If I did a cross join between um, all the, the stores and all the square feet um, from ASO sample, I would just get that, uh, that entire list of every possible combination. It wouldn't be right. It would have uh, each store with every single one of the, every single one of the different square feet, the square feet numbers. Um, I only want the square feet that's for that specific store. Right? So that's what the cross join attribute allows me to do. Now, this is undocumented as far as I can find until 19C. But I went back and I'll, I do this from time to time. I'll go back and test new features and see when they really put them in. You know, did they put it in before and just didn't tell anybody? Um, so it actually works. I, I run 11124 patch 39 right now. And um, the cross join attribute does work. And just a note on 11.12.4.39, for those of you who are on the last session, when Mike Larimer was talking about SBase and Docker, 
I've been running SBase in Docker um, because I have the privilege of working in Applied OLAP. I've been running it since uh, January of last year. So a long time and it's awesome. And you type in literally one line and you it builds an SBase server for you, which is like so cool. And so that is really, uh, that's gonna be awesome for anybody who likes to like tinker around. So I am I can bring up one of like 10 different patch levels on my laptop of, of SBase uh, within like two minutes. So it's really pretty cool. Um, I'm looking forward to Oracle getting more involved in that and, and rolling that out. So anyway, undocumented until 19C. So let me give you an example. Uh, I talked about this a little bit, but I've got my now my cross join attribute function. And I'm just going to give it my, I'm going to give it members of level zero stores. So all the stores, I want all the level zero stores. And I'm going to join that with the children of square footage, which is an um, attribute, or it's a roll up in my attribute dimension. Right. So that's going to, and one thing I want to point out here, I'm getting all excited about this cross join. Um, I've got my, in my set here for columns, I've got it empty. And you can do that in MDX. You don't have to specify a set. You can leave it empty. And so this is really going to act kind of like a metadata retrieve. I don't want anything on my columns. I just want metadata. I just want information about the outline. And so here we go. What do we get? Very simply, I get my list of stores and I get the correct square footage for each store. If I had used the regular cross join function, I'd have that first store 4118 and then I'd have it listed with every single one of my square footage. I don't want that. This is what I want. And this is what I get. All right, another example here. I can nest these too. So I talked about nesting cross joins. You can nest cross join attributes. So now I don't want just my square footage. I also want the store manager. So I'm able to pull out this information, very flexible, very powerful. Now I've got my concise list of stores, square footage, store manager, the list could go on. We could build this out and you could pull back whatever metadata you want. All right, cool stuff. All right, hierarchy information. So I can use dimension properties to pull additional metadata. So I can actually do a parent child extract within MDX. And so I've got an example here. So once again, I've got my empty set on my columns and I'm gonna pull all of the members from my product dimension. That's what I'm gonna pull. But then I'm gonna use this dimension properties keyword. And now I wanna tell it, I wanna bring back that alias too. So give me the alias. And then I'm gonna use this property expression. And the property expression is gonna allow me to pull a function based upon the current access member. Current access member here is whatever product is being processed. So as it goes through the list, okay, give me that, that, that product. Now I want its parent and give me that member name on the rows. Cool. So here I go. I get my, uh, my product. I get my alias and I get my parent. Really simple. So this is stuff that you really couldn't do very easily outside of like API. Um, report script would be I, eh, not fun. You could kind of do it in Excel, but not in a like a batch way, not, not in a really easy, um, where you can send a file over to somebody where you didn't have to intervene and things like that. All right. So next, member on the fly. So this is a really cool feature. 
So here, I'm got my select statement built, and I'm going to ask for profit and sales, but I'm also going to ask for profit percent, which doesn't exist in my cube. And I'm going to ask for that set on the columns. And I'm also going to ask for January, February, March, and April. And oh, this other member called first four months, which doesn't exist in the cube on the rows. I'm going to build those on the fly. So I add a with statement at the beginning. And now I add this um, member statement. And I add my the dimension name of the member I want to add, and then whatever I want to call that member, first four months. And now I tell it as, and now I'm going to give it what function I want it to calculate. So I'm just doing a sum of January through April. Very simple. Now, what's cool is I can add a solve order. So I can say what order this, this formula, this function gets solved. And I'm going to give it a, a value of 10 here. Okay, so we still have to build out our profit percent member. And that's what we'll do up here. So I've added this, another member here, measures, dimension, profit percent. And now I'm going to define that. Multiply profit by 100 and divided by sales. Oh, and by the way, set its solve order to 20. So this happens after the first four months gets added up. Very important, because if you did it the other way, you'd have the incorrect number. And here we go. This is the result that we'd get if we ran this query. We've got our months um, down the rows. We've got our profit sales and profit percent across the columns. Very exciting. All right, let's get more into the bleeding edge here. So exports, exports. We want to pull our data out of our cube. Everybody always wants to pull data out of S-Base, right? And so you've got the ways where you can do, um, you know, a regular export of, of a cube. At level zero, um, you could export the whole thing. You can do it uh, in column format if you're in BSO and ASO, you can't. Right, and so that's kind of a sticky bit some of the times. So these MDX exports have actually uh, evolved a little bit over time. So let's look at generation one. So here we have my MDX statement that I um, showed earlier, where we've got we're bringing back parent, parent and child. So we've got the product members. We're bringing back the alias, and we're bringing back the the parent. But look down here. So I've got my list of members. And then I come over here and now I've got my member alias equals colas, parent equals product. So try to take this and put it into a relational table. Try to send this to someone to interpret it. Uh, they're not going to be real happy with you. And so <laughs> I remember the first time I did an MDX export, I went out to the, um, the Network 54 forum and I said, okay, so what's the command to get a clean output of MDX export? And everybody's like, yeah, sorry, <laughs> it doesn't exist. I'm like, are you kidding me? How could this not exist? We need to be able to pull the data out. Like, why would someone write this and not have a clean way of pulling the data out? But they didn't. So I wrote a parser in Perl to pull this stuff out, which is a pain and I never should have had to do it, but I did it. Um, oh, well. On to generation two. So this was available in 11124 patch 10 and higher. All right, set column separator. So this like, some people were so ecstatic, head over heels. Gary Chrissy wrote a blog entry about it. I think he was the one who bugged uh, Oracle to include it. So we're able to within the, when we're running MDX and MaxL, I can actually put this set column separator and I can specify what um, delimiter I want to use. I love pipe because there's no pipes usually um, in S-Base outlines. Uh, of course, probably somebody has one, but um, I don't like to use commas or tabs or anything like that. And then I run this exact same, this exact same um, select statement 
MDX select statement. And now I get my clean output. So I've got my, my uh, parent, child, and alias here in a way that's actually digestible by some system. Now, it's still not perfect, right? I can spool this out to a file, but I still have, when I spool it out, it gives me this, like the, it, it writes the whole query in there, which I still don't, I'm still not happy with, right? You can you figure out where the semicolon is and strip that stuff off, or you know how many lines it is. And so it's pretty good, right? We're almost there. Like, let's just get over the last little bit, right? On to generation three, 19C and higher. All right, you'll notice my editor changed here. I'm actually, I was actually running this in the Jet UI. We have a new command. Export into file, mind blown. So I can specify the file name. I can tell it, hey, whenever I run this, overwrite the file. Oh, and I get to specify my column delimiter. It's like crazy. Why didn't we do this the first time? All right, we're here. Finally, 19C. Let's go. I've got my, this is an actual export file. It's clean. I can put this somewhere. I can do things with it. I love it. I don't have to write Perl. <laughs> I like to write Perl, but I don't, don't want to have to. All right. So moving on here. So we've got exports taken, taken care of. I think this is hopefully the, the last iteration for, for exports. Now, sub-select. So this is uh, like, if, if you ask the average S-based developer, there's no way they know what sub-select is. Maybe like the top 10 S-based consultants in the world know what sub-select is. Maybe not even. So we can actually, we can nest a secondary select inside of a primary select. This is crazy. It's like, it's almost like MDX is becoming like SQL. What's happening? All right, so this reduces the volume of scanned data. You can essentially create a sub cube, right? So you can say, only have a cube with this data in it, all right? And I'll show you an example. This, so I went through the documentation on this and I had no idea what it, what it meant. And I went through it again and I still had no idea what it meant. And then I emailed, the product managers and they didn't help much on this. And then I went through it like a third or fourth time and actually started using some examples and then it started to click what's happening here. And I'll, hopefully I'll be able to show you exactly what's going on. So I've got my select statement. I'm pulling in January on my columns, just January. So at this point, when I've said January, all that data that's not January in the time dimension ceases to exist, all right? Um, and then I'm gonna ask the for the children of televisions. So just the children of televisions. And this is in ASO SAMP uh, basic. So you can go in and look at this uh, hierarchy if you'd like, but we'll take a look at it in a second. So all the children of televisions and digital cameras. So those aren't like siblings or anything like that. They're in different places. All of the data that's not what I mentioned doesn't exist anymore. It's not like we've cleared it out, but we've just filtered that whole cube down to just that data. And you're saying, hey, I could do that with this slicer. I can just do that. I can specify television, children of television in my slicer. Well, if you specify something in the, in the where clause, you can't specify it in the rows or the columns. So it's totally, this is a totally way of looking at it. All right. So I'm going to put this select statement in a from, instead of from a cube, now it's from this statement. And now on my columns and my, uh, all the members of my product dimension. And so um, I can still, those numbers don't stop existing, the February through December, and the, the, the members of 
the products to mention that I haven't specified in the subselect haven't stopped existing, but the data has. The data has for and for purposes of this MDX, it doesn't. It's not there, but I can still query the members. So it'll just be empty data. So I'm just doing this as a demonstration to show you what's going on. All right. So when I run this, what happens? All right. So I've got my um, my months across the, the columns. And so I'm only bringing back January data because I, I filtered that out in that subselect. And then let's take a, a closer look here at what happens under televisions. So I've got data for the children of televisions here. All right. It adds up to televisions. It adds up to home entertainment. Now I also have digital cameras, which rolls to digital camera, cameras and camcorders and personal electronics. But this is where things get in very interesting. Home entertainment adds up to personal electronics to equal all merchandise. What I essentially have done here is I've created this kind of on the fly attribute calculation. I can pick and choose the members that I want to roll up my, through my products dimension and pull out any of the, the data that I don't want to use. And I've done it completely dynamically, which is like really cool, I think. And I'm not sure of the use case that I want that, that we're going to use this for. Um, I, I can kind of think why maybe uh, Oracle added it. Um, the, the first being that a large customer requested it possibly. The second being that we talked about MDX as being kind of a standards-based query tool. Well, if you go over to um, SQL, the MS, the Microsoft uh, MDX, they have the capabilities of doing sub-selects. So it is kind of a standards-based thing, and maybe they're just trying to get up to that standard. But I'm really looking forward to some folks taking this out and playing around with it and seeing what you can do, um, because I think that there's going to be some cool stuff that comes out of this. This is the bleeding edge stuff. All right, so um, this isn't the next thing that I'm going to talk about is not quite as bleeding edge, but um, kind of close. There's probably not a lot of people out there doing it now. So there's something called an MDX insert. And so I can take data uh, from a select statement and I can insert it into another part of a cube. So here I've got my source. So I'm going to pull actuals data here. And now I'm going to specify that kind of the area that I'm going to do this for on my rows. And these cross joins are kind of like if you think about a fixed statement. So I'm going to pull all the level zeros from year, measures, product, and market. And what am I going to do with that? I'm going to insert it into sample basic. And I'm going to use this insert command. And I'm going to say, hey, I need my scenario actuals to go into my scenario forecast. I'm copying from actual to forecast using MDX in BSO in this case or ASO. I can do the same thing. And what does that mean? That means we have a common calc language between ASO and BSO now. All right, what, what else can we do here? MDX insert calculations. All right, so similar thing, I'm gonna take this, um, I'm gonna create a new member called calc plan. And I'm gonna pull that on my columns here. Same exact um, cross join set on the rows. I'm going to insert that calc plan into budget. Now, remember I talked about member on the fly. I'm going to create my member on the fly. I'm going to create this member calc plan as actual times 110%. So I'm taking my um, actual data, multiplying it by 110% and putting it into budget.
So those limitations that people talk about with ASL, hey, I can't do, hey, I can't do, hey, I can't do. Yeah, you can. You just have to learn the syntax. And is this more complicated than the average BSO script, especially to just calculate, you know, a, a, a actual to budget kind of a copy adding 10%? Um, yeah, it's, it's more complicated, but once you get past kind of some of these cross join and things, it's really not a big deal. So what happens when I actually run this? Um, now I get this MDX insert. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Um, so it, it doesn't give me back data, but it tells me, hey, you did an MDX insert and hey, there were uh, 16,932 rows in that, okay? Now, a couple of uh, miscellaneous items on this insert, the MDX insert. So this, like I said, it works against ASO and BSO. It allows for runtime substitution variables. The, the great thing about MDX insert is when you used to run those execute calculations and execute allocations on ASO, it would get, it would go crazy if you had a dynamic a, a member, a formula, uh, a shared member, it, you'd have, tons of problems with those. This doesn't have any of those kind of problems. I've never run into those with the MDX insert. So it's a lot easier in that regard. And they also added, I haven't had a chance to test this, but this is something um, for those of you who have written a bunch of those uh, execute calculations and allocations in ASO, they've got a config setting called custom calc and alloc through insert. And so when you set that, I guess it's going to run those, it's going to kind of interpret those as an MDX insert. And the MDX insert, when I did test, was um, quite a bit faster than those execute calculations and allocations. Okay, so that's the MDX insert. And um, I've got a couple minutes for a quick demo, assuming that I have connectivity and everything. So let me come over here and I'm gonna to go to my SBase server in the cloud. And let's see here. I'm gonna come into sample basic and Tim, I'm gonna show stop you a sharing. script. Tim, you have to stop sharing your presentation for us to see something else. I'm sorry? You have to stop sharing your presentation for us to see your desktop. Oh, I thought I was sharing my screen. Hang on a second. Thank you. Well, but when the presentation is going, it won't show anything else. Oh, okay. So, um, so you can't see it right now? Um, what we see is um, PowerPoint. Um, okay, now we see your screen. We good? Um, no, I'm just seeing your background. Do you Come have multiple screens? Are you maybe it's on the wrong screen? Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. We'll get there. We will get there. One second. Share. Got it. I see um, the UI. Jet UI. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. All right. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to take a look at my cube real fast. Um, and I'm going to show you a script. Now, I don't have enough time to really get into this script, but I will show you that I'm, this is an MDX script, and I've got this set runtime substitution variables um, setting. And I'm going to now, I can set a market product and year substitution variable. I can grab that off of the sheet um, when the calc is being run in, uh, in SmartView. And so I've got this allocation that I've got down here and I'm using all my substitution variables and everything. All right, cool. So let's come over here to Excel. Now, real quick, let me just refresh, make sure I'm getting data back, connectivity. Okay, so now I can, um, I've added the second scenario to my cube. And I can run this calc. I'm going to put some data, send it up to the cloud. Just let me, let me just, for my own sanity, um, refresh here. 
All right, so we're good. So now it's going to, um, I can click calculate, right? We can only run calc scripts, right? Yeah, but those MDX calcs are now calc scripts. I've got my list of all the MDX calcs. I click on my runtime demo. Hey, look, it figured out what my runtime prompts are. West, Colas, Feb. It's picked those up off the sheet. It's smart. I run it. It ran. Click close. Click refresh. Whoa, I just ran an MDX insert within smart view using runtime sub substitution variables. Uh, so these are things that you can do with MDX and I think it's pretty cool. So um, that's all I have for today. I do want to um, once again mention that we've got this solution, the $200 uh, gift card. So if you guys want to go to this solutions, uh, www.applytolab.com front slash solutions 2020 giveaway one, then um, you can enter for a chance to win a $200 gift card. And with that, I will conclude my presentation if there's any questions. Tim, it looks like there may be a few questions. Um, do you Let's see them or would you like me to read them? I'm, I can um, look here. Is it possible to use substitution variable in MDX statement? It is absolutely possible to use a substitution variable in MDX statement. Um, hi, Tim. We have an existing requirement to reconcile our database back to its Oracle SQL source after it gets built nightly. We currently use MDX through a report script and save results to a CSV file and then import back into Oracle to use SQL to reconcile. Is there any tool that will easily let us compare MDX results to SQL results? Um, I mean, Dodeca, Dodeca will easily allow you to <laughs> reconcile MDX and SQL together. Um, so I, <laughs> that, that's the easiest way that I would do it. But, you know, you could, you could do uh, an MDX export to a file and then um, a SQL export to a file and then use some kind of file comparison tool. I mean, you could even take that MDX and upload it to a SQL table and then run some kind of SQL query to, to do the comparison there. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that, a lot of ways that you can kind of um, overcome that. So I think that's all we had there. All right. It looks like somebody put in the chat, what's the minimum on-prem release to utilize most of these bleeding edge MDX features? So I kind of mentioned as I was, I was um, talking through it, but the sub-select, the MDX insert and the export uh, into file, you're gonna need, um, I don't know if it was available like in the OAC version, uh, which is like a, a version 12 of SBase, which not a lot of people use, but those would be on 19C or in 21C. Okay. Looks like one more question. Where can I get MDX script sample that you are using today? Well, I'll make sure that you guys get this um, presentation. So... I don't know how you guys are giving out the presentations. I know we'll, we'll have recordings available about a week or two after the conference. Yeah, if you if you email me um, timf at appliedolap.com, I can uh, I can shoot you a, a copy of it. No problem. That's awesome. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, I was really happy to see Tim submit a session for this because uh, whenever I hear Tim, whenever I hear you present, your passion, your excitement, just make me remember why I fell in love with S space way back when. So thank you. Thank you so much for showing up and taking the information you've learned and passing it on to everybody.